Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a somewhat long-winded review of a Jayco or Sino Sword Tsunami Katana. And I say long-winded because here's my general plan. I plan on doing a conventional style review for the sword and then basically, you know, while it's in good shape and somewhat new from the manufacturer, and then I'm going to break it. Uh, the thing I need you to know before I go too far into anything is that one, I reached out to uh, the Sino Sword or Jayco Sword basically after a, a subscriber said, hey, uh, what do you think of these swords? And I said, I've never had one, but uh, I'll see if I can get one. And I reached out to the company and said, hey, do you mind if I review one of your swords? Would you be willing to send me a sample? And they did, and this is what they sent me. So uh, my plan is to, to do a review and then break it and then kind of give you my thoughts along the way. But know that I did get it for free as a review sample, and that may inherently make me biased, so you know before you hear any of my ramblings. Now, I don't think it's going to necessarily make me biased, but I uh, have to acknowledge that it could. Uh, additionally, I do plan on breaking it. I know that makes some people kind of anxious, uh, and they don't like to see it. The idea of them sending this to me was, was potentially to do destructive tests, so I don't know if they are necessarily expecting me to do it, but at the same time, uh, it's implied that they're not expecting the sword back. And honestly, I feel a little weird if I get a free sword from a manufacturer for the purposes of review, and I don't have to send it back, which is good, because sending it to China would probably cost a lot of money. Uh, but I, I don't really feel good about having a free sword at the end of the day. So if I break it, monetarily, it's worth less money. And for some reason, that makes me feel better about it, but it's also kind of fun to break them, no lie. Anyway, uh, moving on with the review part. This is the Jayco Sino Sword website. You can see that this sword is the one they sent me. It's a little bit different uh, in that the sword has some blah 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 color differences. This one appears brown and the one I have is blue. Uh, over here it looks like it's got a different koiguchi uh, or mouth area horn part on the saya. I also noticed that uh, this picture shows the hamon in the sword. I've had a lot of difficulty photographing the hamon, and that's not necessarily something that's terribly bad. The, the thing to note about uh, a hamon is that uh, it doesn't really always show up without some heavy etching or polishing. As you may have noticed, this sword retails on their website for $200, and at $200 you can't necessarily uh, expect a whole lot. In this light, though, uh, you can see that it's coming out just a little zazzier than it does in some of the photos where I didn't have direct sunlight cooperating with me. But in any respect, there's certainly a hamon there. It's just under a mirror polish, so a little tough to see. Uh, what we have is we have some measurements right over here. I've taken the liberty of doing a few uh, bits. So this is kind of a copy of the information that's on the website and then what I was able to measure. In this case, I have 27 inches without the habaki when I'm talking about them. The blade length is measured from the tippy top here to the Munmachi here. That's this little uh, kind of gap right there, the, the place where the blade is considered starting. So it doesn't include the habaki, which adds about an inch of measurement. Uh, in this particular case, you can see that I have about a half an inch difference. I have 27 and a half inches versus 28 inches. There's a half inch difference there. That's pretty reasonable considering these are handmade pieces, uh, but at the same time that might be a big deal to some folks, so worth noting. Uh, the handle, uh, it's advertised at 10 and a half inches. I have 11 and a quarter inches in total, so there's a little bit more space on here. There's a full extra inch pretty much. Uh, moto haba saki haba moto kasane uh, saki kasane. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing them right, but let me try and elaborate on what those are. Uh, the moto haba saki haba is a measurement from this space here, kind of above the habaki, how thick and wide the blade is. Uh, uh, saki haba is a measurement kind of at the yokote or yokote or whatever you want to, this kind of line area on the kasaki, kind of where the tip begins, how wide it is here, and that tells you how much the blade tapers down. So how thick it is and then how thin it is gives you an idea of, of how, how much it, it tapers and how much less material it is at the end. Uh, the the um, moto kasane, sake kasane, at the same points of measurement, it measures the thickness of the blade uh, here and, and up here. And basically that should give you an idea of how much the blade tapers, how thick it is at the base, how thin it is at the tip, and that might give you some idea of you know, I guess general sizing or how, how it would handle. Uh, so those are what the measurements are. Uh, so website says 0.94 inches. 
or 0.26. You can actually see that these are pretty, uh, pretty much on the nose here. 0.26 uh, Saki Haba, 0.92. This one's a little thinner. Uh, 0.29 inches for Moto Designer, 0.28. Uh, 0.21. So other than the half inch difference that I have uh, seen uh, with the, the blade length, uh, these are some of the, the most closely represented measurements that I've, I've seen in a production sort. A lot of time they vary a lot more than this. Uh, the Sori curvature 0.7 and I have 0.71. Again, very, very accurate. I don't know that the I haven't measured the Kasaki. I don't generally do it. Chu Kasaki seems like a Chu Kasaki, I suppose. Uh, and then I have a point of balance measurement here at 5.75 inches from the Suba. Uh, the other thing I guess I would note if it's interesting to you in terms of measurements, and I will cover this again, is I have a link to the Weapon Dynamics computer. So in terms of measurements as I'm going over them, I have calculated the weight and mass and all of this kind of stuff and put in these points to perhaps give you a better idea of how those measurements translate into handling. I'll cover this a little bit later and I'll put a link to it in the description down below, but I also have those measurements for you. All in all, I would say that I'm actually pretty impressed with the website and how accurate these measurements are in comparison to what I was actually given. As I've noted in many cases, I've, I've done this comparison with a lot of other manufacturers and very rarely are they, uh, are they terribly accurate. And that's not bad, that's, well, it's not good either. Uh, I guess variation is expected, but if this is your first sword purchase, well, you know, uh, if you want a 28 inch blade, because that's what your system of study has said you should get, and then you get a 27 and a half inch blade, uh, is that not going to be acceptable? Are you not going to be able to use it in class? Uh, or maybe you've had a 28 inch blade, you're ordering a 29 inch blade because you, you want something that's going to force you to do a uh, Sayabiki, or you're, you're looking to get something that, uh, uh, gives you a little bit of extra reach and you get a 28 inch blade. Those variations can make, well, they would irritate me, I guess. So that's, that's why I try and note them. I digress though. The point is that they are actually pretty accurate. That's enough with the website. Now, uh, the other thing I'm going to frame up that you can see, I don't know where else these swords are frankly sold. Uh, the website from the manufacturer advertises them at $200 and I have to keep that in mind as a frame of reference when I'm reviewing this. Uh, you've seen me review some other fancy pantsy swords, and in a nutshell, $200 is not a ton of money. So I have to kind of keep the competitive landscape in view while I give you my thoughts on these things. I'm probably not going to say much different. I'm going to kind of keep in comparison to some of the higher end things. But what I see as bad or value oriented might change around based on, you know, the fact that this is definitely on the lower end scale of price. $200 is, is kind of a pretty reasonable, you expect to have a, a functional thing that's not going to break in half, uh, but you're not necessarily expecting all of the details to get hit out of the park, uh, and you expect, I would say, at $200, some compromise in terms of uh, overall assembly and attention to detail, but you're still expecting something functional that works as a sword. So, with that in mind, let's get on with the actual looking at the sword. Let's just look at some aesthetic stuff, and I know that this is really subjective, but what I do note is that my eye is not inherently drawn to one thing. Uh, from an aesthetic perspective, that's good. The blues uh, between the Sageo, the Saya, the Saya, the Ska, all seem to match, and that's tough because sometimes the dye used for the Sageo and the silk and the Ito doesn't really match the lacquer and the Saya, and so when you use three different blue parts, basically, if they don't really match well, it looks like three different colors. I don't personally see that here, and my lighting might be creating that effect for you. But in a nutshell, it looks very uh, consistent to me. So I pick up three colors. I pick up the blues. I pick up this gold and bronze accent here, and the Manuki as well in the fittings, and then the black on the Samegawa. And I, I think it's uh, aesthetically very simple, but pleasing to the eye. My eye is not inherently drawn to any one thing. Um, aesthetics are always very subjective. Maybe you like something bolder or crazier or different. Uh, or something with a little more zazz, or maybe you hate blue and you want red, or you hate red and you want black, or something. I don't know, but uh, general aesthetics, I, I think it looks it looks simple and good. I mean, it's it's a uh, attempt at uh, basic, simple refinement. I don't know that it necessarily hits the mark, but at the same time, I don't think it's a bad looking sword inherently. Anyway, on to the next bit that's maybe less subjective. If I'm looking at the fittings, so starting at the Kashra, or this little hilt or butt cap or 
not hilt, but pommel, if you would, from the European. It's not really a pommel, though. But anyway, this little cap on the end of the side. Uh, what I'm seeing here is that it is cast. The casting quality is really not fantastic, but it's not bad either. You can make out enough details and lines and the waves that it, it does not appear bad in any way. It's not loose, but the main point that I note about the Kashra is really how it lines up with the Ito, and that is that here, if I pull on it, you are able to see uh, that there is a pretty reasonable little ledge on there. Now the reason that's a problem is that when you're using it and you're, you're throwing your tip out there, your, your hand is usually down here. This is actually a little bit sharp and pretty uncomfortable. Uh, worse, worse on really where your finger is than where your palm might be, uh, but there's a ledge on either side and that is, that is not pleasant. It might wear down or loosen up over time. The kasha is tight, doesn't appear to wiggle around or have any give at the moment. Uh, but at the same time, that ledge is uh, is not fun. The Fuji, if I look at just the general fittings, also has a ledge. The transitions are not great in really any any regard. It, it seems to line up here, but there's a ledge here, and it it's not so bad on the other side here. It's pretty good there. And uh, the, the casting quality just on the fittings aesthetically, it, it's, not, it's not bad, it's not good. Uh, it's kind of right in the middle. It, it's an attempt at a really detailed and, and kind of ornate side. There's supposed to be a lot of details in here and I can make out the waves, but it's just um, fudgy a little bit, a little uh, kind of just lacking in crispness. And when you see a lot of the kind of historic ocean uh, themes on, on some of these things that can be very ornate and very detailed and this one just is lacking on that a little bit. It might be because these fittings have been cast many times it's tough to say. The Manuki actually have a little bit more detail in them obviously they're obscured by the Ito but fitting wise um, I'm not I'm not terribly impressed but for 200 bucks again th this is being very nitpicky uh, they're perfectly acceptable. They don't appear uh, overdone or gaudy. They're in kind of a golden theme. I think that goes well with the blue or a brass uh, theme, but at the same time, uh, while they're not terribly crisp, they're not gaudy or ugly or uh, dumb. My main complaint would be that they don't line up, and this right here I think is going to irritate me a bit during testing, so we'll find that out. So the website actually says that the Ito is cotton. Uh, I don't I mean, it looks like silk. It's, it's got kind of a sheen to it, uh, which uh, very often they are done with some sort of synthetic something something silk or synthetic material. But the website actually says uh, high quality cotton Ito. What I will note about it is that the Ito is actually uh, very, very tight. I have no problem, you know, I, I really, this is a very, very tight bit of Ito. Um, I'm, I'm kind of impressed with that. Uh, it's tighter than most swords that I've seen from uh, Hanoi and other manufacturers. Uh, it's very tight. The, that said, um, it's not super well done. The diamonds are, are reasonably even, actually. They're, they're not bad, but uh, it bulks out in certain areas, kind of has a, a bit of an odd shape to it. I can tell where the panel lines are, um, and that's that's not necessarily great, but the Ito is tight, um, and the diamonds are reasonably even. So for two hundred dollars, I'm actually uh, I'm not wowed by by the the wrap, but um, I'm surprised at least. This is very functional and and completely acceptable for the the price point. Um, I'm not super happy with the transitions or shape. I mean it it looks like it's making an an attempt at an hourglass shape here, but just seems off. Um, my hands are pretty big, and this feels comfortable, but at the same time, uh, it gets it gets pretty pretty meaty here. Um, not not bad though, not terrible. It just seems a little a little large, and um, some of the Ito kind of transitions here are just not great in the wrap. The Samegawa skin underneath is obviously a panel, uh, but at the same time, I can, I mean, the skin is not very high quality. It's got small nodules in it, but it's been lacquered, and though that oftentimes 
obscures how big or small the nodules are. So for what it is, it seems good, you know, completely acceptable. It doesn't look like synthetic skin or anything like that. Um, and, and it looks just fine. I can't make out the edge of the panels. I can underneath the Ito because the, the wrap is tight and that, that's something that'll happen. Uh, but I can't actually make out any spots where the panels have not been wrapped with Ito. So uh, that's again, quite good. Oftentimes you can make out the wood alongside the, the panels uh, underneath the Ito wrap and I don't see any of that. So overall, pretty, pretty good. Uh, I also want to look at the Suka to see if it is cracked out of the box. Um, before I do any testing or anything like that, it's a good thing to know what I'm working with. If it's cracked before I started, it's very likely that this will not survive and will crack. And if it doesn't, I, I will probably cut it or damage it in such a way to examine, examine it inside anyway. Um, but just so we have a, a point of a reference, a baseline, uh, I'm going to look at it now. And good news is, let's see if I can get this, uh, I do not see any cracking whatsoever on the sky. Moving on to the Suba area here, uh, one thing I'm going to note, out of the box, it's tight, it doesn't wiggle around. I'm pushing on it, wiggling it up and down, it doesn't move around. The Saya holds the blade reasonably tight, so if I jiggle it upside down, it doesn't fall out, and it doesn't take a tremendous amount of pressure to push it out, but it doesn't come out easy if I try to toss it or jostle it. Onto the, the Saya. Um, the Koiguchi area kind of has this, yeah, it's probably tough to see, but this kind of blacky, resiny area. It, it's not not terribly well done, in my, my personal opinion. It's like a horn ovoid is wrapped around, like it's got a horn part on it, but it's just not executed properly. Um, the way the, the sign is supposed to be constructed is, is a bit different than this. Uh, at least in, in a traditional sense, the Koiguchi is a lot thicker in terms of horn and the wood that comes up is uh, kind of precision executed. This this looks like a compromise to, to deliver a, a $200 sword, but it at the moment is functional. The lacquer work, uh, you know, as you can see, it's, it's functional. The lacquer work is, is good. I don't spot any pings, nings, dip, dips, chips, or anything like that. It's not uh, terribly smooth. It's got some some ripples, so the the finish sanding perhaps wasn't perfect, and it has a pretty consistent thickness. It doesn't taper kind of gradually as as you might like to see in in some swords, but uh, it's it's perfectly acceptable. It feels decent in my hand, and uh, as I noted, no no pings or chips, and gloss is a it's a subjective thing. It's actually it's easy to clean, but it gets mucked up with fingerprints really really quick. The Segeo that came with the blade is uh, really long as well, and uh, that's not necessarily bad. When I do uh, say something along the lines of Katori, uh, a shorter Segeo is, is perfectly fine, but in when I do Toyama Ryu, uh, oftentimes the shorter Segeos don't, don't really work, and it makes it a little awkward, so um, the fact that it came with a nice long Segeo is kind of pleasant. If your style needs something shorter, you can you know, trim it or tie it back or do something different, but um, it's tough to make a shorter Segeo longer, right? Anyway, uh, the Segeo is fine. The little Shitadome pieces, as soon as I untied it, it did come in a nice presentation knot. I untied it and tied this kind of haphazard knot, but it wasn't a very acceptable presentation knot that came out. Uh, it, was, it was tight, but untied like it was supposed to. Uh, so if you buy a new one, uh, presumably it'll come in a presentation knot with, you know, kind of the what you would conventionally see. But these little Shiridome pieces, they're not glued in, uh, so they come out pretty easy. And this is a little distracting. I would probably either glue them in or remove them. Um, they're, they definitely don't hold in the curry kata, this, this thing here tight. Uh, the other thing I'll note about the paint is that the curry kata did not get done uh, terribly well. And this is gonna be tough to see, but I'll, I'll get a better camera in there so you can see it. The curry kata did not come out come out terribly well at all. Uh, there's some little paint mucks around there that looked like it wasn't properly painted or maybe had to be, I don't know about re-glued, but there, there's just some ugly down there that, that looks like it wasn't quite done correctly. Everything else, uh, paint-wise, perfectly acceptable. Moving on to the Habaki, as I noted, the um, 
The Habaki on the website actually looks different than this. The Habaki on the website would be one I would prefer because it has a little bit of texture in it. I, I, I mean, basically this brass Habaki is what I see on just about every uh, production sword ever made. So it's perfectly functional. It fits in the Saya correctly and holds correctly and it does the job that it's supposed to do. But at the same time, I've seen it so many times that I kind of like the one in the website photo a little better. Just to remind you, this is what was pictured in the website. It had the company emblem. It had the company emblem on it and a rain pattern. Uh, it didn't. The one on the website doesn't necessarily look all that great, personally. Uh, the the quality it kind of looks a little. Uh, I don't know. It's just aesthetically not wonderful but it's different and I, I think I would prefer personally uh, something with a little more personal touch uh, than just the the plain version but again that is an aesthetic thing which is personally is, is totally subjective so maybe you feel the same or maybe you don't uh, the general shape of the blade it doesn't have a terribly huge sorry it's pretty easy to do drawing practice with I did a bit of handling with it and I'll show you that in just a moment uh, the polish on it is very mirror like and so from the, the mirror polish standpoint, it's tough to make out the hamon. I had difficulty getting it in the video that I took. In this light, again, you can make out the hamon with relative ease. It's not a folded blade. There's nothing to, there, I don't make out any banding in the steel uh, or any really aesthetic characteristics that I think are warranting, you know, extra attention. Uh, but what I can do is I can show you the planes. In a $200 sword, this is something I look at pretty frequently in just about every sword. And very often, even in higher end swords, uh, the planes, the flats of the blade along this surface is, is ripply. And this is actually very, very clean and very flat. Uh, for a $200 sword, I am impressed by that. The, the grinding and polish work on this is uh, not perfect, but at the same time, for what you are getting here, uh, I, I would not expect it to be clean and flat in that area. It's a tough thing to do. The lines along the, the shinogi and whatnot are not super crisp, but they don't wiggle around. The polish is just obviously mirror, and it's, it's flattened some of the crispness of the lines a little bit. Uh, the Yakote doesn't appear to have any attempt at, at burnishing or, or anything like that, uh, or the Kasaki, I should say, sorry. It doesn't really look like it's been polished in a different direction or anything. Um, and again, for $200, polishing is very arduous, hand, laborious labor. I don't certainly expect anything special to be done to a blade for 200 bucks. I mean, uh, the fact that it's shiny and you can make out the hamon is is certainly all I would, I'll, you know, is above what I would expect for $200. And the fact that, you, that it's meeting that is, is good. Um, the planes being flat, the Kasaki looking really even as nice as it does for, for 200 bucks is impressive. Is it great? No, but for $200, is it a good value? Yeah, it seems seems that way to me. Uh, I'm not noticing any, any pings or dings, and again, I, I don't know from the manufacturer of the website if this sword is, is secondhand or has any issues. I've handled it a little bit, and, and so it has some blemishes. It came in oil. I've, I've cleaned most of that off. Uh, but you can see there's there's a couple little scratched areas here. Uh, I think a lot of those are likely due from the Saya rub that might have come along the way from shipping. Uh, I am also noticing uh, some minor pocky rusty marks. Now, the thing I want to note about that is that yesterday I did a little bit of handling. I cleaned off the oil, did dry handling on the blade, uh, and then I didn't clean it when I put it away. I did like a basic wipe off. Um, but these spaces are from where I held the blade uh, to get some of that dynamic sword uh, data for the, the sword computer. And this was, you know, something I was doing to, to measure, uh, measure the, the sword. And what it looks like is my fingerprints have rusted into the blade uh, overnight. So, not... <laughs> Certainly not great. Uh, the sword will rust, obviously, pretty quick. It's becoming more humid in Minnesota, but it looks like uh, these these rusty blemish spots here are my doing from yesterday, not cleaning and oiling the blade properly. They were not there, I should note, when I received 
the sword. So some of these really minor blemishes that might kind of shine out in the light. It looks like there's one. Stuff like that might have been in in the sword when, when I received it. Uh, but these kind of blemishes that are showing up here, right where my light is shining, this area, uh, they were not part of the sword. The, that's from me. Anyway, uh, I don't need to beat a horse on, on that one, and I would normally be very disappointed in myself, but this one is destined for uh, destruction, so I, I don't really have to be too beat up about it. The other thing I'm going to note about the edge on this blade is that it appears to have a secondary bevel. It's a fine kind of line, which hopefully is, is coming out in some of the camera work I'm doing, but it has a very fine secondary bevel. Uh, the edge is not not refined to a, a good clean edge. And before I do any other testing on it, here's how sharp it came from the manufacturer. I'm certainly not known for doing this fairly well. I mean, that's not an uh, insane result, but it's, it's obviously quite sharp. I'm not usually very dexterous when it comes to, to doing paper cutting things, and that's a better result than I get on other swords. So uh, straight out of the box, seems quite good. So the thing I'm going to note about the Nakago is uh, it doesn't have a signature. There is really nothing unique or special about it. There are some things that I will note. Um, one, the... Makugi area with the Ana where the line was drilled here is, is really rough and hasn't been filed So this was shaped and then they drilled it and there's still burrs on the hole right here uh, The reason that's worth noting is that sometimes that can make it difficult to put the ska back in the back over the Nakago So when I put this back on that stuff catches in there uh, it's, it's real dirty as well. So I guess that's <laughs> worth noting uh, it does look like there might have been some, some glue or something on the blade, and there's some pretty deep sanding marks, but I don't see anything inherently that looks like a crack uh, or, or some other major issue. Uh, it's, not, it's not terribly clean. It's not super pretty. And this is a lot of cases, I mean, this is what I expect. Um, there's no, most people that buy these swords, frankly, are never going to take the handle off. Now, the reason that you would is to clean your sword, right? So you take your handle off, you can slide this down, get your habaki off, and now you can actually clean underneath the, uh, underneath the, the handle. And you can get all the grime and water and stuff that falls down from the things you're cutting, uh, and clean it out so that it doesn't rust rust your blade up. Uh, so that's that's why you'd want to do it. It's kind of expected that you do at some point. Um, but anyway, most people probably will never do it. So companies, when you're talking about $200 for a sword, I don't expect this area to look refined. But if you look at, say, the Citadel review that I did, uh, when I took the handle off, you could see that there's kind of very specifically placed file marks and the profile of the blade is preserved and the signature is put in with a, a lot of care. There is a signature as well. There's a serial number um, and all of that stuff is done very intentionally to, to make it look a particular way. This ska possess, or this Nakago possesses none of that but at $200 I could totally understand why they wouldn't. All that takes time and energy and effort and then when you're done you're going to put the handle on and the person that buys it nine times out of ten or maybe even more than that is never going to take the handle off and look at it. So most of the customers are spending money on something that they really don't need or want and uh, and so you know why, why put it on there. For $200 what I see here is, is perfectly acceptable. Next question is how did it handle just doing some basic movements around with the sword and frankly um, it feels stout in my hand. I, I feel its its presence for a 27 and a half inch blade. 
I think it feels bigger and, and clunkier perhaps than it should, but I have to temper that opinion with the fact that, again, it's $200. I, I don't expect somebody have, to have really put a lot of refining characteristics and holding the blade, you know, really the Smith thinking about how this particular blade is going to be mounted and how it should feel and how it should balance. Um, I don't expect all of that attention to, to detail. That would take a lot of time and I couldn't expect it to be done for 200 bucks. So does it feel good for $200? Yeah, yeah, it feels perfectly acceptable for 200 bucks. Uh, nimble enough, it's a little clunkier and heavier perhaps than, uh, than what I think it, it could be with a little bit more refinement. But at the same time, uh, it, it feels manageable, the tip feels uh, controllable, uh, it feels like I, I can move it around, it, it didn't feel cumbersome to, to start moving, it was a little harder to, to stop, um, I had some difficulty in, in getting the, the tip thrown out, and I also feel this when I move it around, I feel the, the little lip here kind of biting into my pinky. Um, the rest of it, there's a lot of detail in the Tsuba, if I jam my hand up here, it doesn't really cut into me. And the handle is a little, um, you know, schwanzy shaped. I don't know. It feels a little bigger than it needs to be. But the Ito was tight, and I only swung it around a little bit. It's, it remained tight. It's still, uh, overall, for $200, you know, I have to say I'm reasonably, reasonably pleased. Now is the part where I'm going to try and answer, is it worth it or not? And it's a little bit tricky to do. I have to keep in mind that it's 200 bucks, And in $200, there's two primary general categories of things to consider. One, what else is available at 200 bucks? You have some practical series stuff on Cult of Athena from Hanway. You have pieces on Sword and Army from Minatoshi. You have some uh, offerings from Musashi. You have some random eBay vendors. Uh, you have uh, some pieces from Ronin Katana and their entry-level series. And all of those things are, are going to be around the same ballpark or have the ability to be around the same ballpark. Now, I've done a review on the Hanway Practical Plus, which is a little bit more than this one, uh, but you can get the, say, Practical XL on Cult of Athena for a little over $200. A little more expensive, but same ballpark. Uh, the Ronin Katana RK series is a little less expensive. There's pieces from Minatoshi, but I haven't done a review or really owned as many of them, so it's tough for me to speak on one particular model from Munatoshi that's $200 and competes with this. Uh, there's other random eBay vendors and things like that, so uh, I don't really have a lot that I can speak to there, but there are a lot of other $200 swords on the market, so does this one do anything inherently better than any of them? Uh, no, but there's no glaring faults with it, other than this little dinghy right here. Uh, this is going to be super irritating depending on what you're doing with the sword. But other than that, the fact that the Ito is really tight and clean, aesthetically, everything kind of lines up reasonably well for $200. Nothing about this sword uh, says or screams bad. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to cut or use it yet at this point in the review, so we'll be able to elaborate and find out more later on with that. But, yeah, for $200, the price seems completely reasonable, and nothing that I'm seeing right now would, make, would tell me to steer you away from it. Aesthetically, if you like it, it's a good sword. But uh, so is the Hanway Practical Plus. I, was, I, was, I thought that was actually a better feeling sword than this. This one feels a little clunkier than that sword did. Um, I've had some pieces from Minatoshi that were very light, but most of the ones that I've had that were a little bit lighter than this were also more expensive, at least lighter feeling in my hand. Then we've had the Ronin RK series. That's a little less expensive. I did a destructive test on that. It took a licking and kept on ticking and uh, assembly. I don't think it, the Ito was as tight. There were some things about the Ronin that, again, it was a you know kind of a factory second model that I tested, and it was several years ago. But it, it felt really good in my hand. It felt lighter and a little bit more comfortable than this one. So there's other options on the table at $200, but if you want something with a little bit of uh, meat on the bone that feels kind of stouter and you know a little heavier in your hand, uh, this one is, seems to be assembled pretty well. My cautionary tales would come from folks that are going to be doing, um, say, you want to cut the Tommy uh, specifically for Tuyamaru. Then the Hanway Practical XL has a geometry that's probably a little bit more suited to that specific task of cutting to Tommy mats. If you're going to cut water bottles and other random stuff, then that geometry doesn't necessarily hold a lot of sway for you. It's really geared to cut to Tommy mats, but in that case, I think it might be a better suited sword tool for that one uh, activity. If you're going to be doing a lot of Iaido, uh, you're going to be doing a lot of drawing practice. This little lip right here is a real biatch when you're doing thousands of repetitions of the same type of draw over and over and over again. 
Uh, you could file it down, but it's not something I think you should have to do straight out of the box. The Ito's tight, that's actually a good selling point. It's tighter than most of the others, and that addresses a problem that many other swords have had. At least this one model that I have has, has pretty solid Ito work on it. It's a pretty solid wrap on it for $200. Is it a, a fantastic perfect wrap? No, but the fact that it's tight and reasonably even is, is better than most that you get for 200 bucks. But this little, uh, the, the lineup here is, is just not good. Um, that, that'll bite India, and you could fix it. Again, should you have to? No. Do other swords have the same issue at 200 bucks? Uh, sometimes, yes. But I didn't notice the same issue with the Practical Plus that I did some testing on. Uh, I've had a lot of Practical Pluses. It's not a common thing that I see. The Ito is usually looser, so it has a different type of ska problem. Uh, but at the same time, I certainly wouldn't want to drag my pinky across that hundreds of times in a day. In a day. So uh, for any Ito, it's also kind of heavy, and I don't know that I'd really want to do lots and lots of repetitions with this sword. It feels pretty heavy in my hand. But for general use, for somebody that wants to go and have some fun in their backyard, for somebody that wants to cut a variety of different types of targets, rolled newspapers or something like that, uh, for somebody that uh, you know doesn't mind some of the little aesthetic issues or maybe is, is going to uh, wear it down or grind it off, uh, you know, yeah, it seems seems perfectly reasonable. In fact, I think for two hundred dollars, you're getting a pretty good value. Just that there's other products that you might be a little bit more familiar with at two hundred bucks. Still, I'm really glad that they sent me this sword. Um, I admittedly had no familiarity with JKO, J Jco, or Sino swords. The fact that I can't say the name correctly it means that I still don't have a ton of familiarity. But this is a very promising, very decent sword. The fact that the Edo's tight, the planes are flat, there's some impressive things to this sword that other manufacturers have trouble doing. And and that's that's good. Um, I'm glad I got a chance to see it because I don't know that they would have been a sword brand that I, I would have gone out and purchased otherwise. We'll look at a couple other things uh, during the testing side of things. But uh, in general, my impression right now is that if you wanted to go and spend two hundred dollars because aesthetically you like the sword, I think it's a pretty solid value. Just be aware of your other options and make sure that one of them isn't better suited to the particular task that you have. But as a general use sword, yeah, it seems like a pretty solid value for two hundred bucks, and I have no problem saying, sure, pick one up if it interests you. The other thing that I would say maybe is one positive thing is that the company takes a lot of special orders. I had difficulty finding it on the website now, but they do offer some custom order stuff. So if you can get a sword at a similar $200 price that better suits your personal tastes, I mean, all the better. The Practical series from Hanwei, uh, the Ronin RK series, as much variety as they have in that, it might be tougher to get exactly what you're looking for out of a sword, or at least closer to exactly what you're looking for. So if they were able to offer you something in a similar build quality that maybe had the length you want, or the color Ito that you want, or the style of Saya that you want, um, that might be even more impressive, uh, especially if they can keep that within the $200 price point. Anyway, let's move on to some other stuff. The first bit of cutting I did was at the Toyama Dojo. And basically, in talking to the person that gave me this sword to test and review, they said that it's often used by practitioners to cut the Tommy mats, that that is one of its intended purposes. So I figure that's what I'm trying to learn how to do and not, uh, not suck at. So let's bring it right there and give it a whirl. Now, you'll notice that initially I have a lot of trouble cutting through the tatami mat. It doesn't work very well if I let the sword do the work. I, I find that I have to really put a little lot of muscle into it to get, get through the tatami mat. And that's not something that typically I, I have to do. If I move over to my Hanwei bamboo mat, which I also brought with and also cut with on the same day so that you could get us an idea of a different comparable sword. Now, my Hanwei bamboo mat has been remounted. It doesn't look like a Hanwei bamboo mat, but underneath that fancy facade is basically just a standard Hanwei bamboo mat that hasn't been sharpened after many, many, many a cut. So in, in contrast, you can see that the, the sharpness level of my Hanwei bamboo mat seems to be superior, at least the way I move the sword and the medium that I'm cutting. Frankly, the initial test that I did at the dojo told me a lot about the sword, and uh, frankly, it's not not great. The secondary bevel really impacted my cutting performance, and that's really enough for me to say like, hey, in terms of a dojo cutter, this really isn't the best one that I've tested. Now, maybe they don't all come with secondary bevels. Uh, you could also sharpen this one, and I have no doubt that it could hold a keen edge. However, straight out of the box, with this as my only example to test, 
it, it, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture in my opinion, at least if your intent, intended purpose is cutting to Tommy mats in a dojo style or competitive or refinement type scenario. Now, there are other uses that you might want to have with the sword, and the next test I'm going to do is going to be just kind of some fun backyard cutting. I'm going to retest some tatami mats, I'm going to cut some water bottles, and you're going to see me do those things. Then I'll move on to some other stupid stuff that's completely abusive, and you'll see a little bit of that too. I'll show some of that and then recap my feelings at the end of it, and I'm going to try and shut up and just let you watch the cutting in between. Also note that I'm testing it in comparison to a Hanway Lion Dog at the same time, and up at the top of the screen you're going to see the Jayco sword cutting or the Hanway cutting, and I'll give you an idea of, of which footage you're seeing by the, by the note above, if the sword in the video doesn't do it for you.
Now you've seen what I've done with this sword. Now keep in contrast that the Hanoi Lion Dog that I was using to compare is a much bigger, uh, much more expensive sword. So not only is it in weight class that's much, much heavier, much uh, more cumbersome to move around, but it also costs about five times as much as one of these swords or the, the Jayco sword that I'm testing it against. So just as a comparison though, I, I included it. You could see in the water bottles, I didn't have as much difficulty cutting through a water bottle, but I could still feel that it was not uh, exactly light, lively, or easy to even cut through water bottles. I felt some drag. Uh, it was easy if I moved the sword briskly or moved it at speed or put some, some oofta behind it, if, as we Minnesotans might say. I didn't notice the same effect with the Hanway, though the Hanway is a much heavier blade, so perhaps I didn't have to. The tatami mat so is where I really started to notice a difference. In terms of cutting, the tatami had a very similar experience, as I mentioned, and if I gave a light strike and let the sword do the work, it didn't make it through the tatami. If I gave a, a much more powerful strike, then I did make it through the tatami. But you shouldn't really have to do that, and it, it makes you almost have to lose control of the weapon to make it through your target. And that's not really where the challenge of cutting tatami is supposed to come from. The Lion Dog, by contrast, wouldn't be what I would exactly call great either. However, it was much easier. Whether it be a softer strike or a harder strike, I felt like... I could make it through the tatami mat much, much more easily than I could with the Jayco sword. Again, keep in mind that price and size difference though. Uh, then I moved on to some silliness and I cut some wood, just some hardened wooden uh, branches in the backyard. Didn't notice any edge deformation or any, any blemishes really to speak of on the sword. And then I did more stupid stuff like cut bottles of shaving cream just for the comedic effect. And then I cut a copper pipe as well and frankly you know i'm actually pretty surprised i'm going to show you some images much more closely of the edge damage on the sword now and basically there, there's really very minimal damage all of this could be effectively repaired especially since the sword already has a secondary bevel i feel like even i could probably muster my way through cleaning up these minor nicks now keep in mind uh, it cut an aluminum can which isn't necessarily crazy but i did whack it into a copper pipe uh, a few times and that would usually leave a ding, especially given what I've done to it. So nothing uh, terribly crazy on the abrasive side so far, but given how well it's held up, it, it seems to be a stout, worthy blade in terms of its construction. It's not chipping, it's not bending, and the dings and, and nicks that I see in the blade are, are something I would completely expect given what I've done. Anyway, take a look at some of this video here. You can see some of them very, very closely. You can see under this microscope image you're able to see uh, the, the dings quite a bit more significantly. Uh, and you can see that they're very minor. They don't go in, I don't, I don't know that I would even call this a millimeter. Anyway, that's what I've done so far. I'm gonna move on to more silly, more completely nonsense abusive stuff and we'll see how the sword holds up. At this point though, I'm relatively confident in saying that I'm not terribly impressed with it as a tatami mat cutter or as a light, lively backyard bottle cutter. Uh, this sword has to fall into a different category, and I'm not exactly sure what that would be, but if you like the feel of a stout sword in your hand, you want something that has a secondary bevel so you're not afraid to sharpen it at home, uh, this is certainly something that seems to be holding up to the punishment I'm throwing at it. The Ito is still tight and everything is, is still in good order. So from that aspect, if you're looking for a backyard cutter that has a little bit more meat on the bone and something that you don't mind reprofiling or, or sharpening, then this is, uh, you know, shaping up to be a reasonable option if that's what you're looking for. Now I'm going to move on to some really silly stuff. I'm going to take the sword, whack it into some branches and some brush. My neighbor had some trees that needed me to fell. Uh, they're really pretty small, not quite saplings, but not really much more than three inches in diameter at the base. So I'm going to whack it into some of that type of stuff. Then I'm going to move on to some sword-on-sword -sword contact. Now. I'm going to just let this play out, let you watch, and I'll recap some stuff at the end.
Let me recap some of what you've seen here. I'm going to do my best to explain. I know it's been over an hour. I'm exhausted. You're exhausted if you're even still with me. But this will be my last long-winded rant about the sword. I'm going to sum up what you saw. First, I cut some brush. I was actually really impressed with the brush. I thought it did a great job. Some of the stuff was about three inches wide at the base. And I think most of the stuff I cut was probably closer to two inches in diameter. But it did really well. It was actually easier for me to cut that than I expected. I thought I was really going to have to push hard through it or that it would stop a lot more, especially given how it worked on tatami. But it actually cut brush reasonably well. I was pretty consistently monitoring for bends or twists or edge damage. And I didn't see any of that. Now, a lot of the fast forwarding that you saw through the... the the cutting stuff that I was doing is, is basically so you could see all of the trauma that the sword went through. I don't expect you to be terribly entertained by it, but I think it's important to note so that you can see everything that happened and not just when it broke or when it did something interesting. Uh, all the steps leading up to the sword breaking are important for you to note, especially if you're considering buying one. Anyway, I also whacked it in some coconuts. Again, same story. It actually did really well. I thought there'd be some edge damage. There wasn't. Uh, then I took the tip. I jammed it into a stump repeatedly. I whacked it into the stump directly on the tip. I used the tip almost as like a drill bit or a bore into the stump. The tip was fine. Again, very impressed by that. I thought the tip would break. I fully expected it to. That's what I was trying to do. It wasn't until I really started torquing on the sword and bending it past 15 degrees that it started taking a set. And when I whacked it into a stump and really started twisting and bending and torquing on the blade, that's when a bend would easily set in. And it was basically easy to bend back and forth at that point. Once I bent it a good amount, uh, it, it did not straighten up in a way that that made the sword very rigid. It was much easier to bend after I had bent it back and forth a couple times. I could whack it on the side of the stump with a little bit of force and it would set and bend back and forth a little bit. Now the next test I did, it's important for me to note this was not intentionally a long sword versus katana video, though admittedly it might come off that way. Uh, note that the sword, the long sword in that video was under heavy distress. It's from a previous video where I failed to frankly destroy it in a previous destruction test. I've chucked 80 pound cinder blocks at that sword repeatedly and it didn't break. So the fact that it finally did, especially when I was whacking another sword into it, edge on edge contact, is not terribly surprising. So just know that, don't think that this is some sort of magic sword or anything like that. That sword had some had some shit wrong with it. The point to note though was that it was actually still pretty cool that it happened. I slowed it down, I hope you had fun with it. I sure had fun, I found that very surprising. I was doing the test more or less to see how the edge handles edge on edge contact or contact with steel. And it did exactly what I thought it would do. That's when really serious edge damage started to happen. Big dings, big nicks, big chunks fell out of the sword or got caught in the blade. There was a couple big chunks that broke off and got stuck in the other sword, which is always something that I think is really cool when it happens. Uh, but that is exactly what has happened with other differentially hardened swords that have tested, so it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Now, when the sword broke, frankly, I was not expecting it. The sword broke at a time uh, where basically I thought I was going to have to start throwing rocks at it or do something harder or maybe sand it down and take a hammer to it or uh, maybe like a log splitter or something. I wasn't quite sure, but uh, whacking it on the spine basically seemed to, to break it in half. And, and that was a little unexpected, though. I'm not going to really say that that's bad. I, I was intentionally trying to break it. It did break at a time that I wasn't necessarily thinking it would. But it still held up a lot. I mean, I, I whacked it in a tree brush, and that, again, that's why I took you on the journey the whole way through all the stupid things that I did so that you could see some of the nonsense, all of the, the stupid things that I put the sword through before it ended up breaking. There's a myriad of strikes directly to another sword's edge while I'm holding it. A lot of shock went into the sword before before it really had any issue. So in terms of being durable, I think it, it definitely exceeded my expectations there. Now, there are some things that I'm going to note about the sword in terms of its condition. Uh, for you metallurgy geeks, I don't know what a good grain structure looks like, but maybe you do. So under a microscope, I'm going to show you some of what the grain structure looks like. Uh, additionally, just note, I don't know if this is a good or a bad grain structure. Uh, I took it under my little video microscope, so hopefully you do. And if you do, I'd appreciate it if you threw it in the comments below. Also note that uh, in addition, I saw some waviness along the uh, the edges or the flats of the blade near where all the trauma came in. I don't know exactly what that metallurgical effect is called, but there's some blistering along the flats of the sword. Uh, it might be from it bending, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe there are cracks, uh, I'm not, I'm not again very sure. This almost looks like a saw. No, let's, anyway. Uh, the other thing that I took a quick look at was 
the uh, ska of the sword. So the Kashra did come off during testing. Again, it was when I was doing stupid stuff and the Ito still remained usable. You could wrap some duct tape around it and still keep going if you had to. Um, the ska did crack though. It took me a little bit to find it. I had to stare at it quite a bit because the cracks are very small and it still seems quite tight. I also noticed after I unraveled it a little bit that it's secured or wrapped with shigami, these little triangle things that go in there. I didn't notice that at first. Uh, but it's an additional detail and it shows, I mean, it's one extra step that frankly takes time, energy, effort to put in. So the fact that you get that in there for 200 bucks is, is a, bit of a, a bit of a surprise and very pleasant, but probably is one of the reasons that the ska feels uh, as tight and as good as it does in the hand. Now, note, the Fuchi and Kasher are off, these, these end pieces, so it's a lot weaker than it normally is, but I can still twist it and pull on it, and it's not... Uh, it's not breaking the sword or loosening up the Ito. So uh, the wrap on this sword is, is better than what I would expect. So most things in the sword, frankly, actually uh, impress me. The the wrap here is, is tight. Uh, the diamonds are small, but even the fittings, are, everything doesn't look overly gaudy. Um, the real downside of the sword is, you know, some of the, the superficial aesthetic things you can kind of look past, but the secondary bevel on the edge really affected me when I was cutting tatami mats and made it feel cumbersome even cutting water bottles. It did okay with the water bottles, tatami mats. It was very noticeably different compared to another sword, uh, but it also cut through brush really easy and held up really well. So uh, it, is the sword worth 200 bucks? I mean, yeah, 200 bucks seems very reasonable for the sword. I have no problem recommending it. It seems like a reasonable product, but know that there are some caveats and hopefully I've explained those thoroughly enough after the hour long video that you've watched. Uh, are there other products that are out there that are just as good? Probably, yeah, you know, I, I can think of some things from Ronin, from Hanway, and I've mentioned them along the way. Uh, nothing about the sword here necessarily makes me think you should go out and buy 20 of them right now, but uh, at the same time, if any of the, the benefits that I've noted along the way here seem of value to you, then great. It's, it's a very strong, sturdy product. At 200 bucks, I find it pretty impressive. In fact, I'm very impressed at what you can get for $200 nowadays. The, the fact that you have a functional sword that can hold up as well as this one did for $200 is, is awesome. Anyway, that's all I have for you. I know it has been a long journey. Thank you for sticking with me if you're still here. Uh, if you like the video, please uh, throw a like in. Uh, and if you have any comments, if you think I missed something, misrepresented something, throw it in the comments below. I would appreciate knowing it. And uh, that, I promise, is all I have for you. As always, cheers and thanks for watching. Motohaba. No. Motohaba's different. I look like a smart reviewer right now. Moon Machi. Moon Machi. Or the, the termination of the end point. Let's try that again.
can hear the difference when the sword hits the tatami. Yes. Oh, saw that coming. Good sweet hey, though. <laughs> Don't take me into this. Are you enjoying the festivities, my yeah. love? Are you still happy you married me? Yeah.